Good morning. It is Friday, May the 28th, and this is The Drill. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. So, uh, first up is going to be the, the daily offering for spiritual warfare. Then uh, we're going to have the Pledge of Allegiance, the Star Spangled Banner, and then after that, uh, another offering from Mr. Vox Day. All that when I come back. Thank you. May 28th, understand the blessing of leadership. I control the course of world events. I remove kings and set up other kings. I give wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. You should be subject to the governing authorities because they have been appointed by me. Pray, intercede, and give thanks for all men, all kings, and all who are in authority. Do not be like the dreamers who reject authority and speak evil of dignitaries. Prayer declaration. Power and might are in your hands, Lord. It is at your discretion that people are made great and given strength. I will obey and be submissive to those who rule over me. I will pray, intercede, and give thanks for all men and all who are in authority. Amen. And um, so the first thing I'm thinking about when I'm reading that is the Constitution of the United States. So that's what I'm grateful for. That's the authority in my life is, besides God and God's word, is the Constitution of uh, the United States. So there's a second setting something up here. Trying to set something up. Okay, so we got that ready. And now uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. And now, the Star-Spangled Banner. Magnificent. I could li- listen to that all day, over and over and over and over again. Absolutely beautiful. Gives me chills when I listen to it. So the uh, prayer declaration is to uh, remind us that uh, the battles here go deep and that um, uh, only uh, conservatives are um, Christian or monotheistic and also that uh, patriotism matters. First of all, God matters, but patriotism matters, and only conservatives can be patriots because everyone else is globalist. And so um, uh, we as conservatives are the uh, patriots in this country, and this is to uh, remind us of that. So uh, when I come back, um, 
uh, more of um, Vox Day and the Single Justice Warriors, or actually the uh, Social Justice Warriors. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. A lot of uh, social justice warriors wildly overrate their ability to argue. I like to think that I may have helped a few of them better understand the effective limits of their ability. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what one thinks of one's own ability to argue. What matters is what those who have actually observed one's arguments think of them. In any event, what I find more interesting than a perfectly normal inability to correctly self-assess is how most people are completely unable to expose false arguments, despite the fact that the tools for doing so have been readily av available for literally excuse me, thousands of years. And he's absolutely correct. If anybody in the audience has read any uh, Plato, Aristotle, etc., uh, and realized that the, the battle of rhetorical battles had been going on for thousands of years, you have the, uh, uh, the guys that were out teaching people how to win arguments, but without having really any content investment in any type of content, just using rhetor rhetorical tools and tricks in order to uh, win, win debates. And uh, so that's been going on for literally thousands of years. Back to the book. But then Aristotle understood that for some people, the perception is much more important than the observable reality. Quote, now for some people, it is better worthwhile to seem to be wise than to be wise without seeming to be. For the art of the sophist, and that's what I was getting at, sophistry, is the semblance of wisdom without the reality. And the sophist is one who makes money from an apparent, apparent but unreal wisdom. For them, then, it is clearly essential also to seem to accomplish the task of a wise man rather than to accomplish it without seeming to do so. Those who have read SJW's Always Lie will recall how, in his rhetoric, uh, Aristotle provided us with a guide to the two languages of persuasion, dialectic and rhetoric, and warned us that some individuals are limited to the latter. However, it is another, even more famous work of his that is of interest to us here, as the sixth work of his Organon, as the standard collection of his works on logic, are known, provides us with a guide to the understanding that flawed and dishonest foundations of many arguments presented in support of social justice. And is more commonly known as the sophistical refutations. Details 13 specific logical fallacies, several of which are habitually committed by SJWs, while more than a few readers have found Aristotle's, Aristotle's rhetoric to be a little on the convoluted side. Uh, the refutations are relatively straightforward. They're very short, and it's well worth reading as it specifically identifies a number of basic tactics that are repeatedly utilized by those who are presenting invalid arguments or, as is more often the case, presenting a false refutation of another's argument. And Aristotle makes the connection between social justice warriors and sophistry by noting in rhetoric that a man is a sophist because he has a certain kind of moral purpose. The SJW naturally gravitates towards sophistry because his twisted morality does not recognize association with the truth to be moral, but rather association with the social justice narrative. Aristotle defines the 13 fallacies he identifies into two sections, those that primarily concern playing word games and those that do not. Uh, those, quote, those ways of producing the false appearance of an argument which depend on language are six in number. They are ambiguity, uh, amphiboly, Combination, division of words, accent, form of expression. Of this, we may assure ourselves both by induction and by syllogistic proof based on this, and it may be on other assumptions as well, that this is the number of ways in which we might fall into uh, mean the same thing by the same names or expressions. Refutations, then, that depend upon language are drawn from these commonplace rules. Of fallacies, on the other hand, that are independent of language, there are seven kinds. Fallacies in the language. Ambiguity, amphib amphibology, combination, division, accent, form of expression. Fallacies not in language. Accident, secundum quid, irrelevant conclusion, begging the question, false cause, affirming the consequent, complex question. 
Don't be alarmed by the unfamiliar terms. As it happens, if you've ever encountered a social justice warrior, then you're familiar with many, if not most, of the fallacious argument styles. To begin with, one very detailed example, what Aristotle calls ambiguity, is simply substituting one definition for another, thereby allowing the social justice warrior to magically transform X into not X in order to refute his opponent's argument. Aristotle helpfully provides several examples of this. Quote, arguments such as the following depend on ambiguity. Those learn who know, for it is those who know their letters who learn the letters dictated to them. For to learn is ambiguous. It signifies both to understand by the use of knowledge and also to acquire knowledge. Again, evils are good for what needs to be is good and evils must needs to be. For what needs to be has a double meaning. It means that what is inevitable, as often is the case with evils too, for evil of some kind is inevitable, while on the other hand we say of good things as well that they need to be. Moreover, the same man is both seated and standing, and he is both sick and in health. For it is he who stood up who is standing, and he who is recovering who is in health. But it is the seated man who stood up, and the sick man who was recovering." For the sick man does so and so, or has so and so done to him, is not single in meaning. Sometimes it means the man who is sick or is seated now. Sometimes the man who was sick formerly. Of course, the man who was recovering was the sick man who really was sick at the time. But the man who is in health is not sick at the same time. He is the sick man in the sense that he is sick now, but that he was, not that he's sick now, but that he used to be sick. To provide a more recent example of a a social justice warrior utilizing both ambiguity and amphiboly, in 2015, the uh, vice president of SFWA, Mary Robinette Cowell, uh, attempted to refute someone's claim that I seldom attacked anyone who had not attacked me first. She asserted the following, quote, Ha! His first mention of me is in mid-2013. He has threatened to post where I live. And yes, he could because he has the SFWA directory. This idea that you can ignore him and he'll go away is demonstrably not how it works. Speaking as someone who has been the repeated target of Vox Day, this strategy does not work. Until April 11, 2015, I have never mentioned him on my blog, ever. I have, uh, I have him blocked on all social media. Unquote. Sounds superficially convincing, doesn't it? And yet this refutation is sophistical, ambiguous, deceptive, and full of lies. First, this was my first and only mention of her in 2013. I was using the cover of her recently released novel as an example of the way in which the science fiction publishers were engaging in their own deceptive and ambiguous practice of selling romance under the guise of science fiction and fantasy. Uh, Quote, consider the cover of Mary Robinson Cowell's new cover, Without a Summer. Cowell is the current vice president of SFWA. She's nice, she's talented, and she's an award-winning writer. She was even nominated for the Best Novel Nebula in 2010. What she isn't is a science fiction slash a fantasy writer. She's a romance writer. The marketing department at Tor Books clearly knows that. Both the handsome prince and the pretty princess with her bluebirds on the cover are straight out of Disney. Giving a Nebula Award to a book like this would be akin to giving Joe Abercrombie the Golden Tea Cozy or whatever award is it the RWA gives out because one of his mentally unstable killers happens to tenderly rape a female captive during a momentary interlude between bloody battles, unquote. That's not exactly the threatening personal attack implied, is it? Second, while it is true that she had never mentioned me on her blog, she had publicly called me out on Twitter. In a flawless example of the amphiboly that Aristotle describes, I prefer to think of it as the SJW's custom dictionary. Quote, how can you claim I attacked you when I didn't even punch you? Sure, I kicked you, stabbed you, and elbowed you in the head, but I didn't actually punch you. Unquote. It's an effective way to hide the lie under a veil of partial truth, at least from those who aren't paying sufficiently close attention. <clears throat> and, um, Let's see, but what about the threat? To, uh, my threat to post where she lives? That's pretty outrageous, is it not? Well, as is usually the case with social justice warrior claims, significant details have been omitted in order to imply the precise opposite of the truth. You see, the science fiction and fantasy community suffers from a pedophilia problem. It has for decades, ranging from fans and science fiction and fantasy writers association members to recognized grandmasters and lifetime achievement award winners. 
on June 24th, 2014, after nearly uh, one year after I was supposedly expelled from SFWA for unspecified thought crimes, I noted the fact that 18 years after Ed Kramer's first arrest for aggravated child molestation, 14 years after his arrest on three counts of child molestation, three years after arrest in Connecticut for risk of injury to a minor, 18 months after being arrested again in Connecticut for violating his bond, and six months after his guilty plea on three counts of child molestation, he was still an active member of SDUF. SFWA. And to prove this, I cited both the 2010 SFWA directory as well as a screen capture, etc. And this is the Twitter exchange between Cowell and me. Let's see here. Uh, what are the facts you speak of? Such a strange and silly custom. Uh, Vox Day. Agent code. Um, now, would you like me to put up the entire 26 scan page scan as evidence, Mary? Mary. Scan of what? As evidence of what? Vox Day, the facts you question, Ed Kramer's membership, Mary Robinette. In 2010, you said he is a current member, which is false. And uh, again, I, I'm guessing that this is all about actually equivocation, where it, you change the subject in a subtle way, uh, but it, it doesn't sound at first blush like you're changing the subject. Sounds like you're answering the question or dealing with the issue. Uh, anyway, so now the point that I was making, and she knew perfectly well, was that I was was that on page 26 of the 2010 SFWA directory, Ed Kramer was listed directly below Mary Robinette Cowell, and therefore posting the page as evidence of her membership would also expose her private address to everyone as well as her telephone number and email address. Because I did not wish to do that, I was pointing out that her demand for evidence would necessitate posting where she lived. Of course, being a social justice warrior, she immediately attempted to deceptively portray this desire to avoid posting where she lived as a threat to do so. <coughs> In so doing, Cowell was attempting to create a false narrative about me attacking her, as well as setting up a false dichotomy uh, between the evidence for Kramer being an active member, etc., etc. So, um... Uh, a couple of things. First of all, what he's not uh, dealing with here is uh, that the social justice warriors want you to prove a negative. That's their strongest tactic and the one that uh, conservatives, the trap that conservatives fall into uh, all the time uh, is trying to prove a negative. It's impossible, and all it's going to do is make you end up making you question your sanity. You have to be able to turn the tables on the uh, lefty and make them prove a positive. So uh, he could have done that here in his, in his little conversation with uh, Ms. Cowell. Um, what are the facts you speak of? Agent code. Would you like me to put up the entire page, 26-page scan? Scan of what? Is evidence of what? So are you? Could, he could come back right now and say, are you denying my allegations, yes or no? Okay, because the, the whole thing with this conversation is control. The left... It is, and that's what any sophist is going to do. Their idea is to control the conversation. They control the conversation. They control the narrative. They control reality, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's why, again, all this is interesting and is good to know for, that he's explaining is good to know for the purposes of your, your own sanity, to understand what it is they're doing and how they're doing it. it. But you don't need to know all these details in order to refute it. So, uh, because you're not going to get have a conversation and say, aha, you're engaging in amphiboly, diddly doodly daddly do, uh, and, then, and then they're going to come back with some more amphiboly, and then you're going to uh, say, ah, more amphiboly, and then another long explanation or refutation of that, and pretty soon what ends up happening is that you get worn out, they're still standing, th and uh, they're still talking, and you've uh, run away to go take a nap or whatever. You need, as I've said since the, the beginning of this podcast, is a short, pithy statement. Uh, usually you want some type of a, a statement or question, uh, is even better, that is going to put the lefty on the spot. So that, that the worst thing that's going to happen is a tie. And sometimes that's all you can hope for. Okay, if you're dealing with somebody that really knows their stuff like this Knowles does, she's somebody who's down for the struggle. She understands how the game is played, and she understands how to play it well. So um, uh, you got to know your stuff as well. And all you're pushing for with a woman like that is a tie. Just shut her down. Shut down her 
uh, complaints. You use her own tactics against her. She wants to use amphibole, I'll do the same thing. She wants to uh, equivocate, I'll do the same thing. And we get nowhere. And she's the one that loses in a tie because she's the one that's trying to create a movement. That's the biggest weakness that the left has, is this attempt to create a movement. They know they can't have social justice paradise unless they get everybody on board. Everyone has to be convinced and moving towards that uh, objective uh, revolution in socialist paradise. So if you simply stand up and say, no, I'm not going along with this in, in some way, shape, or form, they're thwarted. Okay, And um, it's frustrating to them. And if they get thwarted enough, if enough conservatives say no to these folks and stop them dead in their tracks, uh, as after a certain point, they got to quit. They're not getting anywhere. They know they're not going to get anywhere they got to shut up and go home eventually. So, uh, Let me see what else we got. Um, Aristotelian ambiguity is a tactic that is often used by the left, claiming the right to assign to their opponent the only possible meaning of a word that the opponent has used, even when other meanings of that word are much more readily applicable, and the opponent has declared that the assigned meaning was not the meaning utilized. The fact that this requires both mind reading and the opponent's ignorance of his own word choice seldom slows the SJW down because SJWs are always intellectually uh, dishonest. Uh, word games. Given the size of this book, it's not practical to go into similar details with regards to every sophistical refutation and uh, related uh, SJW tactic, but we can at least list them along with an explanation and a brief example of each. Let me see what he's going to do here. I guess he's going to list and go into ambiguity, etc. Uh, fallacies in the language are simply another way of saying that the social justice warrior is playing word games. Uh, and so it's by recognizing that the individual is playing word games and anticipating it. You know the left is going to play word games uh, because, number one, they have no uh, respect for reality. They don't acknowledge reality. As far as they're concerned, it just doesn't exist. Uh, they also don't acknowledge God. They don't, God, no God, no reality, no knowledge, nothing is certain. So this is what allows them to uh, get away with all of the stuff in their own mind. Because you would think, people that are playing these kinds of games, they've got to be driving themselves crazy. But if they've convinced themselves that there is no reality, there's no certainty of knowledge, and there are certainly no universal rights and wrongs, then it's easy for them to uh, go ahead and get away with this, at least in the short run. In the long run, they need uh, medical attention. They've got to go out and get Xanax and Paxil and, and other types of medication to keep themselves from having constant panic attacks and nervous breakdowns. So, um, But again, they, it's uh, shallow. You know it's coming, and so you can thwart it. You can at least stop it. And usually it's the best way to do it is the same way they do. Ask questions. So... Uh, are you saying this? Oh, so are you saying that? Oh, so another way, uh, um, what you're really trying to say is X, Y, Z, which is called paraphrasing, by the way. So you turn around, you paraphrase their arguments. No, no, no. But you have to put them on the spot. If you're the one that's constantly, you find yourself in an argument and you're constantly on the defensive, you're doing it wrong. Stop what you're doing. If you have to, just stop the whole conversation. You know what? I've got uh, somewhere I've got to go. I got, I'm busy. We'll talk about this later. Regroup and figure out exactly where you went wrong so that the next time you have that conversation, you're able to do it uh, right. So, back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. So, um, kind of summing up, I, I didn't get through the whole chapter because it's too detailed. What he should have done, instead of going through ambiguity, amphiboly, and blah, 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 cite Aristotle, say that, you know, I understand how uh, sophistry works from um, Aristotle's uh, books, fine. Um, and then go on to give examples and explain in plain English, instead of all this amphiboly and amb ambiguity stuff, uh, exactly what's going on, how it is that uh, the left works with this, and then give examples of how to uh, stop it, 
That's what's most important here. We're not going to have a quiz, and but that's the way the book acts, as though there's going to be a quiz later, like this is a textbook. And um, no, we're not going to. This is about real life, about what you do when you are encountering uh, the left social justice warriors in your own life, whether it's your family members, uh, your coworkers, your people at church, or whatever, how you're going to deal with that. And by the way, remember, the people you're usually going to deal with are those um, that are useful idiots. They, re- they just simply repeat whatever it is they've heard other people say. And if you provide one single refutation, they fall apart. They don't know what to do. Uh, so don't be intimidated by uh, the, the lefties uh, in your midst. They're easily defeated. And uh, once they get defeated, they're going to start looking for something else because they're going to realize that um, the left provides them with no power at all. That's how they get into being a lefty. They've they've been promised power. Uh, Nancy Pelosi said, we will empower you. Uh, Maxine Waters said, we will empower you. Well, they've done no such thing. They don't have extra power to dole out to their constituents. Uh, They just trick you into believing that so that you'll go along with the program And basically do as you're told. So the idea also that you're going to run into people like Mary Knowles, Biggins, or whatever the hell her name was, is ridiculous. It's just, by and large, it's just not going to happen. Unless, again, you're used to dealing, you're operating in a world in which you're dealing with media and or politicians. Those are usually the two that are most likely to be down for the struggle. To know all the ins and outs of a particular a conversation and uh, or rhetorical tricks and whatnot. So if you run into somebody like that, just happen to run into somebody that is uh, uh, where you feel you're about to lose control of the conversation, again, have something ready in your mind to say, um, you know what, uh, I'm busy. You know what, I've got to go pick up the kids, uh, I whatever, and stop the conversation. Don't give them the satisfaction of turning you into an intellectual pretzel. Or end up questioning your sanity. So as I've always said, if you're in a position where you know you're right, but you think you're, you feel like you're losing the argument, you've done something wrong. You've been tricked, and you got to find out where that trick occurred and uh, correct it. But in the meantime, hey, you know what? I'm busy. Maybe we'll talk about this again later. Bye bye, and get out. Don't ask their permission, okay? Because they're going to try and and um uh you know uh, continue to dominate the conversation wait 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 or something like that and you got to wave them off goodbye you know um and uh, hit the bricks and get out of there regroup find out where you went wrong and uh, be prepared for next time so um that uh, brings me to the conclusion of another episode of the drill and remember to be honest to be smart to be beautiful and i use those terms because the left hates them Uh, As far as they're concerned, if reality doesn't exist, there is no such thing as honesty. And everything comes down to winning and losing. And if uh, there is no reality, then there's no such thing as being smart. Being smart. It's not the objective anymore in our culture to be smart. Smart is not valued. It should be, uh, and it will be again, but it isn't currently valued. Um, So in some cases, stupidity is actually valued. There are some places where people actually uh, try to make the case that stupidity is better than being smart. Uh, Diesel was a clothing manufacturer that that ran a campaign like that. Don't know if they're still doing it, but uh, I don't care because they don't buy their clothes. I'm not interested in, in what they have to say anyways. But the point is, when you see something like that, when there, people are coming out making stupidity, and uh, dumb and dumber, eh, it doesn't really... Um, some people have complained about that movie as, val- as uh, glorifying stupidity, and it really doesn't. It's more of a mockum- mockumentary kind of a, a thing where they're mocking everybody, mocking the stupid, mocking the smart, uh, etc. Usually, you're going to get it with... Um, glorifying stupidity in underdog movies. You're going to get it more in uh, Forrest Gump, for instance, um, trying to suggest that uh, that in in his movie, stupidity just does or in smarts. Smarts doesn't matter. Timing matters. Being in the right place at the right time matters. Luck matters. And so if you're lucky enough to be in the right time at the right place, you'll be successful regardless of how intelligent you are. Not true. But anyways, um, so the, again, being smart is a value, and we need to remember that. And beauty. One of the first things that the left started working on was beauty. Beauty pageants and 
uh, runway models and whatnot, and <clears throat> excuse me, saying uh, trying to suggest that beauty doesn't exist. We still do it today. The left does uh, on Facebook, Instagram, and other places where they'll post pictures of people that are hideously disfigured, and then ask the question, "Isn't she or he beautiful?" And I always respond the same way, "No, but he or she is lovable," and that's the point. So remember, that's the out. If somebody tries to put you on the spot and what they're trying to demonstrate is saying that beauty uh, doesn't exist, beauty and ugliness, they, they just don't exist. They're arbitrary constructs and they're not. Uh, we do find things, human beings, all human beings find things beautiful and they find things ugly and they find the same things beautiful and ugly. This From culture to culture, um, we find the same things beautiful. We find the same things ugly. Axiology is the part of philosophy that studies that to find out what is it about uh, something uh, that triggers us to either be attracted to it or repulsed by it. So not whether or not beauty or, or ugliness actually exist. We already know that they do. So again, be honest, be smart, be beautiful, and advise other people to do the same thing and remember that the left, they have no authority, no power, and they can't win.